climate change and environmental stewardship. And the next presenter is Stop Spraying New Brunswick. Appearing is Caroline Libadarcy. She's chair and Kimberly Kopp, board member. Um, so to Stop Spraying NB, we're, we're very appreciative uh, that you came here today to provide us with presentation. You'll have 20 minutes to present. At the five, when you have five minutes left, I'll raise my hand. If you don't see me, I might have to say to the mic, but I don't mean it as any disrespect. I just want to let you know where you are with the 20 minutes. When the presentation is over, you'll have 40 minutes of uh, questioning, starting with the official opposition. All four parties will get 10 minutes. And just as a notice to the, to the members of the committee, if you can get your question in before the, everything, all the zeros hit, I'll allow it. And I'll also allow for the, for the answer. What makes it hard is I don't want to cut anybody off, but sometimes we go way over and then I, I don't want to do it because it feels like I should let you ask the question, but by the rules, technically I'm supposed to. So it kind of puts me in a bad spot. But So you'll have 20 minutes and we appreciate you being here. And Ms. Uh, Lubadarcy, the floor is yours. Good morning, members of the committee on climate change and environmental stewardship. My name is Carolyn Lubadarcy and I'm chair of Stop Spraying New Brunswick, a nonpartisan group that was founded in 2015. I am glad that we can participate in these historic hearings for New Brunswick. New Brunswickers finally get to see presentations like Dr. Matthew Betts' presentation yesterday about what is happening to our public forests and wildlife. Stop Spraying New Brunswick has three messages for you today. Um, number one, today I represent 35,000 signatories and a very large Facebook discussion group. This is an issue that New Brunswickers care about with legitimate concerns. Together with our supporters, we have made this a major election issue in the past two elections. Two, the government of New Brunswick has to exercise the precautionary principle and ban spraying of glyphosate and other similar acting herbicides on our public lands, primarily forest land, which is what we are about, of course. Uh, number three, spraying serves corporate interests, not the people. Public lands belong to the public to do public good. It is clear that the refusal to adopt an auction system, raise stumpage rates, or stop spraying, that the government of New Brunswick's prime interest is not the people of New Brunswick, but private interests. New Brunswickers witness firsthand what the current forest strategy is doing to our public forests. We are not witnessing sustainable forest management on public land. Instead, our forests are being destroyed. The public does not feel heard. Throughout my presentation, I will read out comments that New Brunswickers have given us about the travesty on our public forest lands. Kevin Shaw from the Miramichi Headwaters Salmon Federation, quote, I grew up in Juniper and I spent all my life in the woods. Winters were hard with little money, so we lived off the land for decades, just like most of the people from our area. Our family froze fiddleheads, pan trout, sea trout, salmon in the spring and summer, along with partridge, deer, and maybe a moose, if we were lucky, in the fall. Almost everyone harvested the abundance of raspberries and blueberries. I worked 35 years on the railroad and traveled the track and back four routes between Chipman and Grand Falls, so I've seen firsthand the result of excessive clear cutting and spraying of glyphosate, or as we call it, brush kill. A first cut used to excite us deer hunters because, a fresh cut, because we knew that in a couple of years it would be prime deer hunting, since there was an abundance of browse. Hunters came from all over New Brunswick to hunt in the Juniper area. Outfitters did well and with lots of US sports coming over to fish salmon and hunt the white-tailed deer. Then came glyphosate spraying and that changed everything. The deer slowly disappeared, moving towards private land and along watershed buffers, trying to find wintering areas. The numbers dwindled. The local store used to register over 200 deer, but now if we register 20, that is a good year. I, along with many, stopped deer hunting since there was just simply none to be had. I joined the Miramichi Headwater Salmon Federation when it started in the 80s in hopes to learn about declining fish numbers and our diminishing water table. Industry told us over and over again that things were okay with fish and deer and that spraying was harmless. For years we believed them. In my mind, industry and government have failed terribly in protecting wildlife and forests. We have attended fish and wildlife sporting shows in Moncton and Sussex with SSMB. 99% of the people feel the same as we do, and our presence was greatly appreciated. People are sick and tired of our forests being poisoned, and there are lots of horror stories for people who have witnessed firsthand the destruction of spraying near their homes and their favorite hunting areas. Luc Albert, quote, food sources are gone after spraying. 
Wildlife, di wildlife dies off due to this. It is a massive loss of food, diversity, cover, and habitat. I've got hunting, and there is no life after they sprayed. Spray plantations are not forests. I miss being able to see forests uncut for kilometers on end in a natural state. It makes me feel like we don't have control of our crown, crown land. It is no longer our forest. It is at the mercy of an industry that will never have enough. Wildlife depends on natural regeneration for survival. The numbers of deer and moose are down. Grouse hare habitat is getting rare due to spraying. The only place you see them is on small private, small private land with natural regeneration." Unquote. The legislature should be the voice of the people who have been very clear during the past three election cycles about where they stand on forestry. The legislature cannot ignore this issue and still pretend to be representatives of New Brunswickers. Jeff Jonah, quote, my family has had a cottage on the Cannabacasis River in the Portage Vale area since 2000. During this time, I've come across many clear cuts on my ATV travels, some within half a mile from the river, some even closer to home, and cottages where we have found the infamous tiny signs showing this area has been sprayed with the herbicide glyphosate. The trout and salmon numbers have plummeted during these last 21 years. When we receive a heavy downpour, the river rises quickly and then silt with silt and then drops just as suddenly. I rarely see rough grouse and songbirds on the trails, whether on the ATV or hiking in the area." Unquote. During the last two elections, the Stop Spraying New Brunswick issue has been a prominent election issue. In 2018, the smaller parties all had promises in their platform to ban this, this practice. And in 2020, every political party participating in the election promised either, uh, except for the PC party, promised to phase out or ban herbicide spraying on crown land, on crown forest. Gino Doucet, quote, as an avid New Brunswick hunter and fisherman, I've witnessed how glyphosate spraying has destroyed natural biodiverse forests into empty brown wastelands for years on end. Areas around our wonderful Mount Carlton remain wastelands along both sides of Route 180. Not only is glyphosate spraying eliminating deer, Plot, food plots, but I've witnessed decade-old deer migration trails flattened and lost forever. When the blocks eventually grow back, it will be a completely different monocultured fir, fir tree landscape. No wonder our deer population is suffering far worse here than in all of our neighboring provinces, provinces and states. I really like what Minister Mike Holland is doing to move hunting and fishing regulation advancements, but they will be short-lived due to his inaction on the natural resources front." Unquote. You are hearing a lot of scientific evidence from scientists this week and from other advocacy groups that show the legitimate concerns associated with forest herbicide spraying. And I don't intend to repeat this during my presentation, but I will quickly touch on a few points. Peer-reviewed uh, and published research done in BC has shown that plants that do not get killed, uh, they grow back looking sickly and deformed. And berry bushes and other plants that survive retain glyphosate for up to a decade. More research recently emerged that reproductive organs of plants are seriously affected by glyphosate. Dr. Simar has researched plantations for decades and she discovered the symbiotic relationship that exists between commercial birch trees and softwood trees. She found that softwood trees are actually healthier when birch trees are pre present on plantations through the sharing of nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon and, and water through mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhiza are a fundamental component to add to the health of a forest or plantation. Forestry practices that include herbicide spraying destroy all these connections and actually encourage disease in the forest industry's preferred softwood trees. Research at McGill University has identified a connection between glyphosate and blue-green algae and also that glyphosate affects algae biodiversity in waterways. It is also interesting that there's a tendency to only measure softwood trees on plantations to measure success when it per makes perfectly good sense, according to some forest experts, that commercially viable hardwood species could be included in an assessment of a plantation plot. SSMB and our supporters want to see forestry management without herbicides, but instead managed by manual silviculture. We know it can be done, and we insist that GNB needs to stop considering what's convenient for the forestry companies. Our supporters do not want to subsidize herbicide spraying. On our public forest, we see we want to see forestry done sustainably, both environmentally and economically, without the need of these crippling subsidies to the taxpayer, which render our largest resource a money loser, as our past Auditor Kim General Kim McPherson concluded. McPherson's 2015 report determined that the province lost money on its Crown Forest resource 
up to the tune of 7 to 10 million annually between the audit period of 2009 and 2014. She named the silviculture program and the licensing payments the provincial government gives to industry for doing silviculture on work on crown forests as the two main contributors to our annual forest deficit. In Quebec, forestry has been done without for herbicides since 2001. As has been mentioned earlier this week by Lois Corbett of CCNB, Quebec developed their forest strategy following extensive public consultation, which is equal, and they came up with a forestry strategy that's ecosystem-based and includes careful logging around advanced growth. The forestry companies did not leave Quebec, by the way, by the way, so it cannot be all that bad there for business. So uh, also Quebec, which is not actually on this uh, image, but Quebec has 75,000 direct forest jobs in, in forestry. This graphic shows you a com comparison of forest jobs per 1,000 cubic meters in timber. As you can see, New Brunswick is at the bottom. So the jobs have only gone down as, as things have continued in New Brunswick. Fortunately, one of our supporters gave us, uh, oh, sorry, I, I skipped something. The tone of invitations by the committee to appear during hearings on glyphosate and other pesticide use in uh, New Brunswick changed in 2021. In 2020, groups were simply invited to appear before the committee to be heard. But in 2021, the invitation included this stipulation, quote, Specifically, the committee invites your evidence-based comments, unquote. 17 months ago, SSMB asked Minister Mike Holland's office for wildlife data on New Brunswick public forests. After repeated promises and back and forth that we would receive the last seven years of data, we unfortunately were provided with none. So Mr. Chair and committee members, how can we make evidence-based comments to your committee when the government refuses to give us data? The Department of Natural Resources has four full-time employees in the habitat section on staff, so surely there must be wildlife data in New Brunswick. Fortunately, one of our supporters gave us the 2017 vertebrate habitat supply document of, uh, which we can, in which we can see that between 2012 and 2022, there is an increase in the number of indicator species that are below threshold requirements for habitat. I will read a few quotes from this paper. Old forest habitats assess that their largest minimum patch sizes declined by 79% from 1.28 million hectares to 272,000 hectares from 1987 to 2012, and are expected to decline by 15% to 231,000 hectares from 2012 to 2037, with most of the change happening by 2022. The sharp decline from 1987 to 2012 was due to harvesting of old forest over the period at a rate which precluded its replacement, due in part to a relatively low abundance of mid-age forest at the outset. Young and mid-age forest habitats at their largest minimum patch sizes increased by 40% from 1987 to 2012 are expected to increase at a further 21% by 2022. We are losing old forest habitat. The single species that is, that is below threshold in 2012, was below threshold in 2012, was the white-breasted nuthatch. But in 2022, those below threshold are white-breasted nuthatch, black-backed woodpecker, and American marten. Just these few reports sound troubling. We need to remember that forest indicator species are the canary in the coal mine in, in forestry. Their decline indicates we are on the verge of losing significant biodiversity in our public forests. There are other forest indicator species we know of that are likely in trouble. Back in 2014, government research by New Brunswick DNR wildlife biologists concluded that minimum habitat thresholds for NB forest indicator species are predicted to become significantly below thresholds. This list includes the American marten, the fisher, northern flying squirrel, red-tailed hawk, barred owl, black-backed woodpecker, pileated woodpecker, white-breasted nuthatch, and the pine warbler. In 2015, all of these NVDR wildlife biologists, including their manager, were transferred out of the wildlife section. These experts are no longer in this department. We also have wildlife data collected by two grade 8 students from the Bathurst area. On their own initiative, these students decided to do a wildlife survey for a class science project under the supervision of science teachers during the winters of 2019, 2020, and 2021, and 2020, 21, because they are very concerned at, at their young age about wildlife in New Brunswick. They counted animal tracks on uh, two plots of each type of uh, clear cut, so they studied three clear cuts, uh, uh, but two plots of each. 
clear cuts with silviculture, naturally regenerating clear cuts, and clear cuts with glyphosate treatment, and found a reduction in animal tracks on clear cuts with glyphosate. If students can do wildlife surveys, surely staff at Habitat section of the Department of Natural Resources must be doing their own surveys. Why not release data to the public? Of course, you have heard a lot from Dr. Matthew Betts yesterday about biodiversity decline related to cumulative amounts of clear cuts and forest herbicide spraying and ecosystem services by birds. And he asked the question, do we trade biodiversity for the forestry sector? And New Brunswickers say no. Please remember that this is our public land. The loss of biodiversity in the rural communities is highlighted by the catastrophic drop in the New Brunswick deer population. The spraying of glyphosate kills the trees that feed deer feed on, and this loss of food has caused a dramatic drop in their numbers here in New Brunswick. Our deer population is now a quarter of what it was 30 years ago. It went from 270,000 to 74,000 over the last three decades. Data comparing New Brunswick, Maine, and Quebec show that the deer harvest numbers in New Brunswick have decreased to 15% in New Brunswick since 1985, whereas numbers are up 300% five minutes? Okay, in Quebec and have remained stable in Maine. And so to add insult to injury, the number of deer yards were cut in half in 2012 and then again in 2014. So deer yards are actually one quarter of what they were. Heather Wood, quote, I've spent most of my adult life living in, in, in or surrounded by dense forests. If I wasn't exploring the back roads, I was fishing the rivers or camping in the deep woods. I've watched what was once a very vibrant and healthy forest become a place that is having difficulty sustaining flora and fauna. Our hardwood ridges no longer straw, draw in the leaf-peeping tourists because our hardwood ridges no longer produce hardwoods. We are spraying them to death, and in my younger days, students were hired to thin the power lines and railway beds, but now they are sprayed. I have watched a healthy forest bed, complete with moss and lichens, creepy crawlies that provided food for the birds and critters that in turn provided waste and or food for other creatures of the land, become a wasteland of nothing, not even the lowly worm. The sign of a healthy garden is the presence of garter snakes. I have not had a garter snake or, not, or seen one in eight years. That is all I need to know about the poisoning of our land." Unquote. Eugene Lapointe speaks of his 40-acre property, which is surrounded by 1,000 acres of private land. There are two pairs of pileated woodpeckers that live within this private land of 1,000 acres that is mixed forest, which contains second growth and old growth, especially eastern white pine, poplar, birch, maple, with some large white and black spruce, white cedar, and black ash and fir. As I'm sure you are aware, pileated woodpeckers uh, need dead woods for shelter and nesting. And other animals do too. Dead woods are a very important part of, of habitat that animals need. Our province is becoming a zoo with trapped species in parcels of forests." Unquote. The comments I have read out clearly reflect the frustration so many of New Brunswickers feel about the state of forestry in New Brunswick. We want to be heard. We want public consultation and full transparency, and we don't want to subsidize something that does not benefit us. In closing, I will leave you with one last comment from a supporter and long-standing opponent of forest herbicide spraying, Jerry LeBlanc, a silviculture worker, who is also the artist of our, of, of our signs and stickers and everything. Jerry LeBlanc, quote, I think we have to bring forward some kind of solution. Greed, jobs, nobody listens. 83% of our forests have been cut and there's no sign of slowdown. My catchphrase is, humans can harvest trees and leave a healthy forest till. Here in Rogersville, there are two machines doing semi-commercial thinning. This provides more jobs, and in 20 years, we may harvest more. It is beautiful work and so neat. We should support these people and make it trendy. Of course, there are patches that need clearing, and yes, replant them, but without spraying. There are several machines of this kind in Kent County. There is one machine that reaches up to 60 feet, and one can sit as co-pilot behind the operator. Let's make these folks famous." Unquote. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the presentation. First, first off, we're going to have uh, questions from the official opposition. That will be Madame Landry. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming this morning, and uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a few questions. I would sure. like to know if you, if you are pushing for a phase out of spraying, a complete ban on herbicide spraying on agriculture, and forest land, 
or not? It, it, what, what is yeah. it exactly that you are hoping Well, for? our mandate is uh, to stop spraying on Crown Forest lands and by NB Power. We are not targeting agriculture. Okay. Um, Lois Corbett explained very eloquently you know, the difference in the amount of uh, glyphosate that lands on agriculture versus forests. And we feel the same way. We, we need to deal with what the, what the big use is in New Brunswick. And that is what people care about. You know, that's what the big deal is about. Okay. Uh, are you aware of any negative impact on human health of uh, spraying in New Brunswick? And, well, there has been no studies done, so I, we make no comment about that because um, I'm a health professional and, we, and I would never um, you know, want to make assumptions about anything unless studies have been done. But probably studies should be done and, and uh, surveys of the population may have to be done. But right now, you know, none of that has been done, so no, no conclusions can be drawn, and I have no opinion on this, and it's really not part of our campaign. Okay. And if there would be a phase-out um, that would be put in place, what would be a reasonable timeline that you would think of? Well, we really think that there's enough evidence now that shows that the precautionary principle needs to be exercised, which means that you press pause on using something. That's really how, what we think. So we really will not be satisfied until it's, it's gone. I mean, we also understand that it can't be overnight, but we definitely don't want to see a very, very minimal decrease. We need to see some significant improvements to feel that there's hope. But I know that New Brunswickers, the ones that we represent, will not be happy until it's all over. And that's why we keep referring to what Quebec is doing, and, um, you know, it is possible to do forestry without herbicide spraying. We know that Vermont did a whole revamp of their forest strategy. I don't know the details, but I think that that's, the onus is on this government to look at what other jurisdictions are doing that does not include uh, herbicide spraying on forests. Because we're talking about public land, and the public should have a say. It doesn't matter on whether some expert thinks that people shouldn't be asking for it. People are feeling so strained you know, by what they witness every day. Uh, this province isn't large, so, you know, it is in our faces everywhere. So that is, I think, is what's happening. You know, it's the, the last straw that just broke the camel's back. There's just too much of it going on. And people are seeing the effects every day, you know, especially the rural population. Uh, thank you. If you have uh, my colleagues have okay. other questions, we have time. Uh, yes. Um, since... Uh, Glyphosate is sprayed on crown land and private land. Do you know where the spring is on other region was not affected with that spray? Do you know if deer, moose, bears are more? Yes. I mean, again, like I am a person that is representing the public. I'm not a okay. scientist, I'm not doing my own research, okay. but I hear eyewitness accounts from our supporters and uh, you know, all the time that they see the difference. You know, they see wildlife in naturally regenerating uh, cuts, but okay. they also understand that we can't just have a bunch of cuts that naturally regenerate. We need old forest habitat. Okay. Animals cannot live just in young forests. No, so because, we, need, yeah. we need old forests. But okay. they see a huge difference between sprayed areas. And I mean, yeah. I've seen for myself, I've made it my business to go and check things out. Okay. And I actually was, uh, I met Radio Canada uh, a week and a half ago in a crownland plantation that was sprayed last year and they could see for themselves okay. what it looked like. Because I'm from Northeast and we're seeing more wildlife uh, species in our region than maybe in the, the last 10 years. So maybe that's why those wildlife move to our region and maybe that's the way that and normally um, an épandage Reasonable spraying that is well done has less impact on wildlife and that way animals can come and come back. It's the same thing for fishing. If there's excessive spraying, that's where we have a problem. So 
So we're not just spraying at that point, we're polluting. And that's two different things. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Labby Darcy, to be here today on behalf of SSNB. I have a few questions. Uh, what can you tell the committee in regards, or have you got more research or more documentation in regards of the new strategy or the Quebec strategy as far as way they're doing forestry uh, without herbicides since 2001. Can you enlighten us on, on what has been done there? Well, I included as a reference uh, um, yeah. his work, and yeah. I did read it, but again, I'm not a forest ecologist, and I probably can't rattle off to you yeah. exactly what they're doing, but I do know in broad strokes you know, that, that what, they, what they're doing is they're planting larger seedlings, and they're doing um, manual silviculture, uh, manu manual cutting of, of competing stuff, but that, that means that it's not killed, right? It's just being kept low so that the other stuff can grow. But um, so that's what I know of, and I know that they are not because that's why they've got this um, uh, gently cutting around old uh, stands. They are, it is an ecology based um, strategy. So okay. they are not there to just chop things down, you know, and because they need, they understand that they need to show respect for old growth because they know it is important for habitat. Okay. So um, with that, do you, and you, you showed a, 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 a page there or whatever with uh, different jobs. Yes. Or, what can you uh, tell us uh, with, with the information you get, maybe more information, with in regards of uh, creating more jobs for New Brunswick through, through the Quebec Quebec model, other models compared to, to New Brunswick? Well, I think uh, I know that in Vermont, uh, they definitely uh, started doing more community-based forestry. So it's not just large industry doing things. And uh, I, again, I don't know all the details off the top of my head. But uh, again, there's a reference I can give you that you yeah. can read that, that would explain it in more detail. Again, done by people that understand this a lot better than I do. So but I do know, um, you know that the numbers are different because forestry is done differently. Here it's very heavy on, on big industry, you know, being as efficient as you can. And it's all for the convenience of industry, plus we subsidize it a lot, you know. But that's not, the jobs don't have to do with the subsidies. But that's an added insult, you know, yeah. to New Brunswickers. Yeah. So, we talked about revamping the forest strategy in New Brunswick. Uh, I agree. Could you uh, give me, for the committee, your recommendation how we should uh, look at revamping the whole forestry strategy? Well, again, I'm not a forester and I'm just representing the public yeah. who wants something different. But I think there are lots of really good experts. Uh, they spoke out before the 2014 deal was uh, signed. There were hundreds of scientists who yeah. had opinions. So I think the expertise is there to do things differently, but the public needs to be included. And yeah. that's what Quebec did. Quebec was told every time, well, as they were changing and adjusting their plan, they were told every time that the public does not want herbicide spraying. Okay. So they listened to that and they found a way to do forestry without it. And that's how it should be, in our okay. opinion. Thank you. Um, my last question in regards, and I, look, I don't want to throw nobody on the bus here. That's not my intent. <laughs> um, but, but when you accuse a minister of not collaborating and stuff like that, it kind of throws a different kind of taste in my mouth, to be honest with you. And, and I'm okay with you accusing the minister, but that, that's, you can do that. But I, I'm, I would like that we be able, the committee could table that, that report so that we would be able to see what, what data you're saying, you're, you're accusing him, but I would like to see the, the, the full information, I think. Is that fair? Yeah, I'm only saying because he's the head of the department. I mean, the buck stops with him. You know, I mean, he has staff and everything. And the thing is, we were told every month that stuff was coming. So it wasn't like we were told nothing could come. You know, uh, Chris Ward was the one that communicated with me, and he said, you know, we can give you stuff from the last seven years because we, um, we archive things beyond that time. And I said, that's fine. You know, I'll be really happy to see that stuff and then he said we can get you some things in batches later and he, he said he had a package ready that was being reviewed in last last June and we never saw any data after that like he did give me a package but they were research articles that I could have found myself there was they were not research articles from New Brunswick they were just studies you know done by scientists but nothing that's New Brunswick specific thank you very much for your time and thank you mr. chair
Okay, next up we'll have uh, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Lou Darcy, for your presentation. Um, a couple of questions. One is, I haven't seen much galvanize so many New Brunswickers around a single issue uh, for quite a while. Um, the number of people signing petition petitions that have been tabled in the Legislative Assembly have set a record, really. Mm -hmm. um, so what is it you think that that is uh, really um, galvanizing people's concern about uh, glyphosate? Why, why, what is it that's driving that concern that people have? Well, the concern is really driven by what they see is happening in the woods. You know, they are seeing a decrease in wildlife. Like I hear people say all the time, including my own husband who grew up here, he said, we used to go driving with dad on rabbit roads. And people say they just aren't there anymore. We just don't see the critters running around like we used to. So it's very, very obvious to people that they are just not seeing the abundance of birds, wildlife, rough grouse. I hear this all the time from, from people. And I mean, I hike a lot and I, I feel the same way. Like we just don't see a lot of wildlife in the forest. And that's just odd, you know? I mean, I've been to other countries, you know, that have better, <laughs> better ecology like Costa Rica. And, you know, they are full of there's so much wildlife, so many birds, and here it just, you know, you're, you're happy to hear a few, but it's just not, there's just something really wrong. You know, it, it, there's, there's really a lack of, of wildlife in the woods, and that's what people say all the time. And they're also, of course, very upset that when they have, hike, when they have hunting shacks or whatever, cottages, you know, that, that near them suddenly a whole stand is gone. So people are seeing that all the time, you know, they've, they've invested money into a little cottage and they're, they enjoy going hunting and hiking, and suddenly a whole chunk of, of land is just gone. And I think because it's just so in people's faces, and I think that was, that's what Matthew Betts explained as well, that in Oregon, some things might be happening further away from people, so it's not as noticeable. I'm not saying that it's not bad then, you know, because I mean, there are still probably people that live there, and in Northern uh, BC, it's an issue because you've got indigenous people probably living there, but not the big, the big population, you know, is not there. So you don't have as many people witnessing what's going on. For us, it's all very easy to see. I mean, all you have to do is drive on the highways and just you just drive by way too much wasteland. Thank you. Um, so one of the studies that has come out recently, a multi-generational study uh, looking at uh, another uh, substance, chemical that was sprayed widely in New Brunswick uh, for many, many years, which was DDT, um, the study wasn't done in New Brunswick, but the study was multi-generational, um, which found that while there was no direct impact on uh, the women exposed, their granddaughters uh, were more susceptible to becoming obese uh, and to developing breast cancer. Their granddaughters, because of the exposure of their grandmothers, who had no particular negative effects. So this is called um, epigenetic yeah. transgenerational inheritance. Um, so it actually makes one think of perhaps there should be a New Brunswick study given the extent of DDT spraying uh, here to see whether that same kind of result is evident in our population. But it does raise, uh, because of the volumes of glyphosate used uh, in forestry here, uh, it does raise the question of whether or not um, this is something that uh, needs to be studied in New Brunswick as well in terms of uh, transgenerational impacts of uh, widespread spraying of, of herbicides. Of course, before it was 2,4,5-T uh, and 2,4-D before, before glyphosate uh, got started, came along. Uh, what do you think of that uh, idea? Well, I think studies are always a good idea, you know, and I, I mean, I'm not saying that we're not, we're not necessarily, because we're focused very much on the ecological impact but I don't, I mean, I think that definitely uh, we need baseline studies on the health pop of the health of New Brunswick population. I mean, people clamor all the time that the cancer rate is high here. We have no idea why. I mean, there are so many factors that can be involved in that and you won't know, you know, until you study it. So that's all I have to say. Have uh, you read some interesting uh, sort of comments or testimony, I'll say, from a variety of people um, I'm wondering if you had anything, received anything, or talked to anyone who's, who's uh, had po have power lines going over their property which were sp sprayed with glyphosate and what their feelings were about that. 
Yeah, I haven't, like it was more in the beginning of the campaign that there people talked about that a lot. Uh, so I haven't heard a whole lot of late uh, about what MB Power is doing. I mean, people don't want it on their land, obviously. Um, and I know that, of course, within the city limits, they can't do it. Uh, and people did get frustrated because initially it sounded like you could call MB Power and say, I don't want, yeah, I know that they've got some of the power line on my land, I don't want it. But then suddenly that, that line of communication was cut off. And I think that was in 2016 that suddenly you couldn't call MB Power and say, I don't want this happening on my land. So yeah, people are upset about that as well. But still, when you compare what MB Power is spraying compared to what's being sprayed on our Crown Forest, there's a huge difference. You know, the maximum sprayed at BC annually by MB Power is 1,500 hectares. And, in, uh, and I, I think last year, it may be because of the pandemic, they didn't do any spraying because they do more ground spraying. So maybe they didn't want to send their crews out because of COVID, you know, because they didn't want them to be near each other. Um, I don't know. That's just my guess. But uh, in 2019, NB Power did spray a bit less, but I heard that was because NB Power didn't need to spray as much. So we don't really know what's happening with NB Power. We don't know what their, what their direction is going to be. But we know that what they do is 1,500 hectares max when we're seeing 15,000 hectares of Crown Forest being sprayed. So that's like, that's quite a big difference. So obviously, the Crown Forest spraying is a much bigger impact. Were you following the, uh, the debates in the, in the Maine legislature and in the, in, in the state of Maine over the, uh, the bill uh, that was recently passed to, um, as I understand it, eliminate the use of glyphosate on their forest? Yes, I mean, I was aware of the bill. We were actually contacted by the grassroots groups that were working on the, the wording of, the, of their legislation. Um, our vice chair is an expert on, on legislation, so he, um, you know, he spoke with them as well and helped them, you know, with crafting the, the suggested language. And um, so, yeah, we've been in close contact with them and we followed it. Uh, I mean, I wasn't able to watch the debates because I work all day, <laughs> so I didn't see that, but I did see articles written, so I kept up to date with what was happening. So we're, you know, we're feeling very uh, optimistic about just that happening around us again, you know, another jurisdiction near us deciding to listen to the public. Ken, I don't know if you're familiar enough uh, with the bill to tell us sort of what, what the substance of that bill actually uh, is. I couldn't uh, read it out to you. I mean, I did see it, but I think it's, ba it's main, mainly just focused on aerial spraying. That, that, that wording is in there uh, of glyphosate. And I think some people then said, oh, you know, but they're doing some by land. So again, I don't know. I'm not a forestry expert. I don't know how much uh, spraying is done on land when it comes to forests, because I'm assuming that most of it is probably aerial because that's how you can get over a big stand. You know, like how else are you going to get to trees and things like that? So yeah, I don't know the exact wording, but uh, you know, it is uh, easy to find. <laughs> I'm but, sure. So am I right to assume that given the Maine uh, is mostly private land, this is applying this applies to aerial spraying over private land in Maine? Uh, it must, but again, I, I honestly didn't check that. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, there is a difference, you know, and I, I think that's the thing, right? Like, you get people speaking out about things. Uh, we are definitely focused on crown forest here because 50% of our forest is crown forest. You know, another jurisdiction may not have that. So, of course, it will be a different language of, of what they would be after. I, I know you're focused on, on crown forest specifically, but because of the nature of the, the yes. uh, widespread use of the herbicide, has, has have people come to you about... Uh, uh, dietary concerns or a dietary exposure from sort of wheat from a global food basket now. Um, so have you heard that from, from people? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we talked to, that's the thing, right? Like we're, we're a, an organization that then has a Facebook group and that it's through that that we reach out to people, that we find people that find us. And so I field a lot of questions, you know, and, and, and I get some concerns, of course, mentioned to, about that, you know, and I think especially the urban population, because they are not always in the forests, you know, they seem to definitely think more about that, right? Like a lot of people think of the thing closest to them, you know, like some of us are just nature lovers no matter where we live, and I'm one of them. I love being out in nature. I love hiking. I love, you know, just admiring what, what nature has to offer, and, and that's why I got involved with this, you know, because I just really, really love being out there and I just don't like seeing what's happening to it. But it's not happening. I live in the city, right? So it's not happening in my backyard. So I think some people worry only about what happens in their backyard. So for them, of course, they would be wondering about nutrition. But I always tell them, I said, that is not our, our mandate is not that. So 
I mean, certainly I know a lot about it. I have a degree in nutritional sciences, so it's not that I don't know a lot about it, but we have to be focused in our campaign. And I've got a lot of other opinions about other things, but you know, this is about this. But I'm more than willing, of course, to help people find out about stuff, you know, so I, I will do that. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your answers. My time is up. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Conroy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Caroline, for being here today. Um, we've met a few times in the past, and, and your work is incredible, and, and your passion for this is, uh, is really to me to commend it as well. Um, you talked a little bit about your, your group. Um, how many members do you have in the uh, group currently? Well, we're over 16,000. And uh, yeah, just in the last few months, I think we gained like a ton of members again. Uh, you know, it, it certainly is a hot season for us in the summer. So we find that things sort of coast along in the winter and then in, uh, as soon as spray season is imminent and people are out and about, you know, people start getting all worked up about it again. <laughs> so your, your members have been growing pretty much every year, I think. Yes. Um, what would you hope that, our, that this committee, that we take from this or that, well, what would happen through this committee? Well, I, I feel that the scope of this committee is too wide. I mean, we really would have hoped that it, was, it would be a committee just on one issue. And I think Lois Cor Cor Corbett also explained that, you know, that if you cast too wide a net and make it about everything, it, it's, it can be tempting to treat everything equally. But I think, you know, I really wish that the committee was just about one issue about crown forest spraying, because then you could really zero in on one thing and not get distracted by a whole bunch of squirrels, as she said, which I thought was great. But anyway, so uh, yeah, so I hope that this is only the beginning. You know, this is not enough. Uh, the public, I mean, it's great that it's an equally weighted committee, as in that every political party had uh, the option to give the same amount of suggestions, I think of who could be presenting, which is very fair. But at the same time, the public was not invited to give their input. You had to be invited to give your input. And I was listening to the committee meeting on, on, Jan on June 11th, and uh, you know, uh, submissions by people who weren't invited were called unsolicited. And I think that that's not really a great way to call it, because everybody should have a right to give their opinion. So I think that this to me is just the beginning, or to us, I shouldn't just speak for myself, is just the beginning of something that needs to be, become a much bigger public consultation process. And it should really be a public consultation process with an eye on the fact that this old forestry act that we have from the 80s needs to be revisited and it needs to be updated and changed. You know, what, what was working then and has only escalated since then is not working now, no, both economically and environmentally. What's that? Both on the economic and environmental front, it's not working. That's what New Brunswick is feel. Oh, and I and I really enjoyed your quotes through here of, you know, everyday citizens that see the difference, um, in the past and um, and over the years, I guess of, of our forestry. Um, began. I've mentioned yesterday we've traveled the trails for the last thirty years on ATVs and four wheelers and bikes and whatever and, and hiking. And we've seen it too. Um, you talked about the increase in clear cuts, the increase in, in wood roads, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, yes. the, and the dust on them. And that's always been um, an issue and a concern of mine is, is, especially with the aerial spray and what's getting into the waterways, but what's getting on the roads. You know, we travel 15, 20 bikes at a time and it causes a lot of dust in what mm -hmm. we're inhaling. Um, testing has been an issue for me. I often wondered why there isn't testing. Is your group or has your group been pushing for any testing or, or has it been considered um, within your group to, to get testing of the, of, you know, what's in the lungs or what's in the, in the bodies from? Um, yeah, I mean, it's been talked about, but it's a very expensive endeavor. You know, um, we looked into the cost, uh, you know, say if hunters wanted to do that, you know, to have organs of, of animals that they um, uh, hunt and kill, uh, to have that analyzed, but it's an extremely expensive uh, process. And, you know, so we just haven't done it. We're, we're a grassroots organization. We don't have the funding. I mean, that's something that would need to be done. Uh, I mean, like Mike, Matthew Beth said, you know, a lot of these studies would be very expensive ones to do, which is really with, out, outside of our ability. No, I think, the, um, I think they should be done provincially and federally. I think the, the, um, the government should be, should be um, doing regular testing to yeah. see what's, what's in our waters, what's in our, on our lands and, and um, you know, and, and the, the uh, the effects that it's having on the people as well. Um, can you speak a little bit about the current condition in the province where nearly all the daily papers are owned by big forestry industry 
and what uh, impact that's having on you know the education for um, for especially you know um, elder people that don't have Facebook or or um, media. What, what that's having. Yeah. What's well, it it's, it's amazing to me that print media can actually be owned by one organization. Uh, as far as I know, that, that, that almost can't be legal. And when I tell people, like I'm, I'm an import, I've been here for 33 years, but I've lived in many places in the world, as you can see in my CV. And when I explain to people who don't live here what it's like, their jaws just drop. They're like, you've got print media that is all owned by one company? The company that's doing a lot of the resource stuff in New Brunswick? That is completely not right. So yeah, it is very concerning that uh, people who rely on the paper are getting a very, very limited uh, uh, intake of news. And that is part of what you would call a captured society. Like we're, we're like a captured province, you know, by, by um, corporations, you know, and, and that's one of the line items. Uh, Don Bowser, my vice chair, is an expert on uh, corruption. And he very clearly states, you know, the different um, signs and symptoms of a captured society, and, and I would think that New Brunswick falls under that um, heading or under that definition. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, your organization has a website that focuses on debunking um, the science that's posted on the Forest Info website. Can you, um, can our committee not rely on that information, in your opinion, that um, to be truthful information and the science behind it? Well, I think it's never okay, um, you know, like the, the, the resource industry and or in resources in New Brunswick, uh, the government that regulates it should have an independent site that educates the public on things with independent research. Forest Info, if you look at what, what is part for, of Forest Info, it's, uh, you know, JDI, it's Forest NB, which, rec which represents industry. So it's, it's totally government holding hands you know, working together with industry to inform the public. That is just not unbiased. Mm -hmm. And I mean, again, like I, I don't want to use my experience as a health professional, but you know, in my line of work, like we take continuing education and we are always told, don't take a course that is sponsored by a company that's trying to sell you stuff. It's going to be an, un, you know, you're not going to get unbiased advice on how to treat your patients. So we are very uh, careful when we select our continuing education that the presenters are not being paid by a company to um, recommend something, you know. So it is, I think it's very problematic and uh, Forest Info wasn't always there, you know. It, I think it was started, I don't know, it was 2013 or something. But, you know, we need an independent uh, mm -hmm. site for people to go to, to get information on forestry in New Brunswick. And that's why we decided to do a debunk of some of the claims that Forest Info makes and we focused on wildlife, you know, because that's our focus. And uh, we just did that so that uh, people have at least another source of information and then they can compare at least another point of view. But we based all the, the information on there on, on data. We didn't just make up our own stuff. Like we based it all on published peer reviewed data. And uh, we pointed out on some things that uh, are very problematic with what Forest Info is claiming. Okay, well, I thank you very much for uh for your uh, answers and, and your passion, like I say, for, for what you do. That's Thanks. all my questions that I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, Minister Holland. Hello, Carolyn. Good to have Hi. you here today. Uh, I have a couple of things. I got three questions, but it may spawn some more. Uh, I appreciate you clearly articulating the fact that agriculture is not a concern of yours. Um, you, you, you're a health professional, but the health component is, is secondary to your focus on Crown land. <coughs> But that crown land only focused, I, I want to dig into that a little bit because, um, you know, we've got uh, 3 million hectares of crown land. 13% of that or 400,000 hectares is in a plantation that receives rotation of, of, of spray. Um, and, you know, that speaks to the fact that those plantations don't have as rich a diversity in, in them to, to, uh, uh, to create an ecological balance. But, by ignoring the, the, the industrial freeholder mm -hmm. and ignoring the private, I'm confused by that because, you know, when we say that we got 400,000 in Crown, if you uh, look at the fact that 37% of industrial freehold is in a plantation that receives um, herbicide, to ignore that, you know, it almost sounds like, you know, you could walk from a Crown plantation that's horrible 
into an industrial plantation, but that's not your concern. So I'm confused by that. Because we know that on public land, you know, when it comes to pub things that the public owns, we want to see action on that first. You know, we don't. We, we feel that because we own land, or as a as a public, you can have more opinions and more um, say on that. You know, it's it's much more difficult to start telling private people what to do, and that's the reason why we chose this this focus. We also know that the 13 percent. Uh, there's an intention to increase that, right? To 20 percent? We have no intention to increase well, that. Well, anyway, I mean, that, we, that was written down. and We I actually one... held the allocation of any future Crown land growth for five years. Well, you haven't so, published that. But uh, last year, Chris Ward clearly mentioned that we could, there we is could a plan increase, to increase it. it to 20 but but or for 25%. you to use the words intentionally are looking to increase it, uh, we are not looking to. We could. But that is not that is not on the stated area. But I mean, is it possible that the folks that have these legitimate concerns and those that grew up here, um, could it be possible that they are seeing biodiversity degradation in areas that aren't crown land, and they're raising those issues with you and and advocating for that? Like they're not seeing this in private or industrial freehold, and no, that's not we, worth having a look at. We always check with people when they come to us with concerns. We always say, "Have you checked that it's crown land?" So we are pretty specific about what we look at, and what we respond to, and what and what our uh, supporters are upset about. Okay, so all the postings that you have on your website have been verified that they're all crown land and they've well, all been sprayed. <laughs> we do our is best. That the, is that the case? Yeah, we do our best. You to verified do so. them. Okay. Well. I mean, when people make a comment, like we can only verify so much. We've got 60,000 people. I was just saying that you know, there's more there's more area in plantation forest that gets sprayed in private land and industrial freehold than all of crown land, and and you know we're introducing the addition of a uh, of another 400,000 hectares to be brought into conservation, guided by conservation groups. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I I, I, I hear a lot of information about the fact that nothing is being done and Betts did a great discussion about the past but going forward when we see advancements like that is that not something that that is recognized as advancements and 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 the containment of industry and the expansion of conservation five percent increase is of course better than what we had but we know that it's still below what what is recommended federally well let's have a look at land mass though that's yes, the, that's more than the know. amount of land that we have in, in plantation forest right now. So that's hardly know, insignificant. We also right? know that industry is getting the best plots of land to do their thing on. Well, we know that. Hold on. Industry is, uh, industry. we have conservation groups that are helping identify yeah. and nominate these groups. We, well, we've already made it very clear that none of those areas uh, will be entered into conservation if it just simply means they're not good for harvesting. Conservation groups are, this is going to be legitimate I'm conservation. Not, I'm not talking about that. I know that there's going to be more conservation, but we haven't seen yet exactly what's going to be conserved. And of course the importance... Well, yeah, is, we've, we've posted all of the nominated areas. I saw the, the nominated areas, yeah. but they're not finalized. And the thing is that it is important to have continuous, and I'm sure you've been told that hopefully by all the NGOs that you're working with, that continuous habitat is very important. So for Mr. Kuhn's point uh, about what's galvanizing people, your con con uh, concerns are the decrease in wildlife and natural spaces. So if, if what you're saying that in the event that biodiversity and continued ecological development, continued focus on conservation, if conservation is part of the forestry management plan and, and, and we see wildlife levels and conservation areas grow, but we still have a forestry sector that uses herbicide, your concern is the decrease in the wildlife. If we address that, so you're not concerned about spraying, if you see the, no, the, the we don't trends want reversed. Spraying. Don't try to nitpick my, what no, I'm No, no, but even in the event that your concerns, which is the decrease in wildlife and natural spaces, if that trend is reversed, then the, the spray is still an issue or it isn't? It's still an issue okay. because I don't think you're going to reach your goals the way you're going. Oh, well, I appreciate that feedback, but I guess... And also, I just want to stress, government only is in charge of Crown land. So, I mean, we can whine all we want about what the what private industry is doing. There's not much you can do about it. I know, so but, we, but, that's, a, that's but a public lobby can put a lot of pressure on industry as well no, as the public as we well. we think that so. our government needs to start looking at the Crown land and do what is good for the people on our Crown land. Uh, uh, we agree on that completely. Now, uh, you're, you're aware that we don't allocate land to forestry companies. We allocate wood volume, mm -hmm. okay? Now, in the event, in the event that we waved a magic wand and stopped any form of herbicide tomorrow, 
the wood companies are still uh, allocated that wood amount. Okay, those are contracts that are that are in place. So in the event that we did that, we're using the smallest possible area to contain industry right now. If herbicide stops, that footprint will grow. It will absolutely increase because they're still owed the allocation of wood. Mm -hmm. How would you work to ensure that, I mean, uh, understanding that legally binding contracts can't be ripped up, how would you then reconcile the fact that, ironically, more forestry would happen in the province of New Brunswick and larger areas of potential con conserved areas would be sacrificed. So how no, would you reconcile that? No, on public that? land, government can give us and take us away. Well, the court, yes. the court system says that no, you've got situations. No, I have situations. heard that there was a review done, actually, and you so know So you're saying it. rip up the contracts we have with the forestry companies? Yes. I mean, okay, we need to you. start from scratch. Thank yes. you. If they, don't, if they can't be happy, like this is again, you're making it sound that you need to keep them happy to give them their No, no, no. Day. I'm talking about when, when governments enter into contractual agreements, whether it be stakeholders in forestry or any other different industry, you know, uh, how do you accommodate them with the contracts that you've entered into while at the same time trying to balance the uh, offset and the dangerous potential uh, damage that you could have to conservation? I mean, the irony is, is that those, those allocations are to be filled how are they going to be filled? We don't allocate land. We allocate mm -hmm. wood volume. I understand. And as a result... But entering into this contract was a bad idea anyway. Hey, you and know what? Yeah, I know. I'm not, but, I'm not arguing needs, on that point. That's, it that's, needs that's, to change. That's what we are all saying. This is not <laughs> good and we don't care. We well, don't want you to feel pressure to give them more allocations, which is not good for the ecology. Well, no, I think that's evidenced by the government's uh, halting of any of the increase of uh, annual level cut on Cran land, the moving forward of doubling the protected areas, the doing it with conservation specialists and ensuring that we are moving forward in a biodiverse and ecologically sustainable way. We can't stand up the trees that were cut, but we can certainly make sure that we do the best with what we have right now. I don't have uh, anything further. Uh, anybody from, from the government? Okay. Uh, Caroline, we really appreciate you being here today. Thank, Thank you for you. the presentation. And uh, is, do, you have, do you have any parting words for the committee? No, I just want, I really wish, hope that the committee understands that they are representatives of the people and that the people come first and no industry interests should ever come first. And I really feel that the Forestry Act needs to be revisited and a bad decision made in 2014 needs to be revisited. And, uh, you know, we had a much better forestry act in 2012 which was then ripped up by industry pressure so this really needs to change and, I'm, and on uh, Ms. Conroy's uh, question I mean this is another sign of a captured society you know this desperate uh, need I don't even understand why we're not going to be sent to the gulag if we don't do what industry wants we need to change how we do things thank you for that thank you for being here today we appreciate your presentation uh, thanks so much okay uh, members